I don't know about you, but I feel like it's a great day. It's a great moment. It's a great moment in time to go ahead and listen to some more Nick Drake. And speaking of more Nick Drake, we're just going to do a complete album listen because why not? You're here. I'm here. We're here. And we're all together. I hope that you guys are having a lovely day out there wherever you may be. I was going to save this album for like a little closer to fall, you know, because I don't know about you guys, but it's like hot over here. <laughs> I know we're still in the throes of summer, uh, but I was like, you know what? I don't feel like waiting. I, that, that's literally it. I, I just don't feel like waiting anymore. So we are going to listen to Nick Drake, complete album listen of Five Leaves Left. This is his debut studio album, which was released in 1968. Uh, a few things just before we go ahead and dive into it. One, a long time ago, uh, before actually our listen of Pink Moon, I had already listened to the first two tracks on side two of the album, Cello Song and Thoughts of Mary Jane. So those two tracks in particular are not first listens, even though we will listen to them again. I've listened to them before, at least on the channel. You can go and find those reactions uh, as well. Also, I was actually gifted the record here, as you all can see. And I'll go through this and I'll show you guys as well as we listen to the music. You may be wondering to yourself, JP, you have a record player. Why aren't you playing the record on the record player? Well, see, that was the plan. And I had actually set up everything and I was getting ready to test because I always have to test to make sure I get the sound levels right and everything. Um, and when I went to connect my microphone over to the uh, record player, as we've done so many times in the past, I, um, I realized something. Remember a few months ago when I was having audio problems and I switched out all my wiring, all my equipment and everything? Well, uh, the new wire I have does not reach back there <laughs> at all. It doesn't even go close. Uh, so until I get a new wire, which is probably going to be a while, to be honest, um, that's, that's not going to happen at this exact time. So that's the reason why we're not using it. I was setting it up. I had moved my, my tidbit all over here. I had changed things. And then I realized, oh, can't quite do that. Uh, <laughs> so, so that's that. Uh, also, as always, before these full album listens, uh, it more than likely will be edited on YouTube, uh, but of course you can go to Patreon, watch it for free. You don't have to sign up, just click the link below, you can listen to the music alongside with me and everything. Uh, and like I said, you don't have to sign up, but if you do want to sign up for as little as $2 a month, it helps me out a great deal, of course, in what we do here. And the final thing before we get into the music itself, actually no, the second to final thing. Let me call out some names who have recommended this, this album to me. Uh, so Sheldon Howells uh, not only recommended the album, but he was the one who had gifted me the album. So Sheldon, I really appreciate that. Thank you so much for sending that over. Uh, others who have recommended it, Dyslexia, Cosmic Cat, Benoit, Des Murray, Kev Truth. Uh, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, Gaia Eternal, I see you across the sea. Empty Squares, Altair. And hold on, I know there's a few more. I just gotta, I just gotta, hold on, let me put another control left right here. Let me do me control left, keep going, keep going. JX Champ and Ken L. And the list goes on from there. The Tech, Merlin's Cat. It goes, it goes, it goes. So anyways, thank you all so much for the recommendation. Now the last thing before we get into the music itself, because I like to take these opportunities if I can to plug an artist to promote a band, whatever it may be. And I would like to promote this particular artist I found on Bandcamp and I enjoy their music. The artist is Azuka uh, from Berlin, Germany. Uh, and I want to recommend uh, her album. At Azem Epu, and I probably mispronounced that. I would like to play just a little bit of her music, maybe kind of get you involved. Um, I'll put a link to her Bandcamp and her YouTube in the com in not the comments, but in the description below. Check out her music; it's actually really, really lovely. Uh, here's just some samples. <laughs> Just a sample, just... Just a sample, just a sample. I'll link, I'll link her below. Uh, go check her out. Let her know where you came from that JP sent you. Uh, but I think that you guys will enjoy that. So anyways, let's go ahead and begin our album listen. Uh, I'll more than likely stop each track, talk about it a little bit after. Maybe I won't, who knows? We'll see how we feel. We'll see how the leaves fall. We'll shake this room up. Hope you guys are ready for it. Let's dive on in. Starting with the first track, Time Has Told Me. Let's relax and get into it. Trouble I love that guitar on the side there. Your 
tears they tell me to hide so leave the wind it's short I I want to say something really quick all right <clears throat> I've made this point many a time on this channel. I want you to think about this. I'm thinking about it. This is his debut album. This is the first song on his debut album, the first one ever released from Nick Drake. And how, how immaculate is that? How absolutely beautiful does that sound? His guitar playing, the light, crisp piano playing in the back, the kind of minimal country adjacent twangs of the guitar as well of course the bass oh the bass it, it's just this beautiful autumnal like come down it's a sunday autumn morning and how beautiful does this sound there's this deep 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 sense of melancholy happiness there's so many feelings that i think drake captures with his voice and what i really like is that there's a power in his voice that's different from many other singers, right? And of course, that's obvious, right? He doesn't need to sing out crazy. He doesn't need to diva up his performance or express himself vocally in a, loudest, in a loud way, you know? Just because you're the loudest one in the room doesn't mean you're the most important and that whatever you're saying means the most. He's expressing himself in quiet, near whispery tones, just... Not muttering to himself, but this is a very introspective way that he's delivering the, the music and what he's saying. That makes the impact to me that much more meaningful. You have to lean in, as it were, to hear what he's saying, to feel what he's saying, and he's saying a lot. And it's just the way that he expresses himself I find really, really touching, very moving. And once again, all the music accompaniment uh, from, is it Richard Thompson on the bass? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> I read that wrong. Richard Thompson on the guitar, electric, and then Danny Thompson. I'm sorry, I, I, I misspoke. Um, obviously, Danny Thompson, Pentangle and such, he's amazing. But how, how wonderful is that the music around him and the musicians that he's surrounded himself with because they don't do a, a job of overshadowing or overpowering the words and what they mean. Because you don't want to take away from Nick Drake and what he's saying and what he's playing. They have to add and in some ways enunciate what he's saying. And I think they did a, a beautiful job in there. That is just music that you get swept up into. And you listen to it as the leaves fall. All five of them. Time has told me you're a rare, rare find. A troubled cure for a troubled mind. And time has told me not to ask for more. For someday our ocean will find its shore. That is such a great line someday our ocean will find its shore one day this this journey will end one day the wave will meet the shore and that is the end of the wave so enjoy it while it lasts live for the moment so i'll leave the ways that are making me be what i really don't want to be leave the ways that are making me love what i really don't want to love time has told me you came with the dawn a soul with no footprint a rose with no dawn your tears, they tell me there's really no way of ending your troubles with things you can say. Everything comes back to time and what he has learned in time. He says, time has told me. So you can take that as the experiences that he gathers um, in time. Now I'm curious, just, just as an adjacent, uh, how old he was when he made this album. Let me see if I can find that super quick. This was released 1968. Uh, he was born 1948. So he's 20 years old at the time of this recording or somewhere you know, right in thereabouts. And I think that around that age, you know, you you have certain experiences. Typically you have some sort of experience with love, a relationship in some in some capacity. And sometimes there's a little bit of immaturity in writing when it comes to that, right? Like how are you gonna write a love song at twenty? You know. But listen to the way that he's saying it. Listen to the words and read the words, really. It's very poetic the way he's saying this and talking about time. Someone who's relatively inexperienced with time. And with years. He's a, an old soul in some ways, huh? Time has told me you're a rare find of tr a troubled cure for a troubled mind. That's a good line, too. A troubled cure for a troubled mind. Maybe he's saying that, you know, he's the cure. And, you know, he's going through things, too. But they can work it out together. I don't know. 
That's kind of interesting. You know what's also kind of interesting? Uh, there's a little side note, a little adjacent that says, I don't know how true this is, this is just what it says. Robert Smith, from The Cure, was inspired to name his band Easy Cure, later just The Cure, from this line. This song gave me the idea for the name of my, of my group. Is that true? I'm gonna, let's confirm that really quick, let's see. How did The Cure come up with, hold on, I didn't spell that right, with their name? Let's see if that's true. Let's see. I had always thought Easy Cure was a bit hippie-ish, a bit American sounding, a bit West Coast, and I hated it. Uh, every other group we liked had the in front of their name, but the Easy Cure sounded stupid, so we just changed it to the Cure. Okay, so so we did get, you know, Easy Cure. Uh, I guess they also had. All right, this is like they've gone through some names. One of their early names was Malice. Listen, we're on a tangent. Okay, ride with me on the tangent. Just ride with me on this one. I want to see if this is true. Uh, let's see the first formation. Blah blah blah. I'm trying to see if there's anything about about Nick Drake on this article from American Songwriter. Let me let me type in Drake on the control F. Nothing's popping up. Nothing's popping up. I don't know. So I don't know if, if that note is true. We'll we'll allow it for now. We'll allow it for now. Let's just go ahead and move on into the next track here on the album, uh, which is going to be Riverman. Is this uh, David Sylvian's Riverman? Run with me, Riverman. And I'll keep hope. If you're if you haven't listened to David Sylvian, shame on you. Go listen to Secrets of the Beehive right now. All right, Riverman. Said she had a word to say. Gonna see the Ooh, river strings. Gonna tell him. Strings came out swinging. Oh, that's gorgeous. Jeez. Okay. Maybe it's because I'm used to Pink Moon. You know, that's the last thing I've heard from Nick Drake. And I'm used to that very stark Manning guitar sound, right? With a lot of space, a lot of open atmosphere. I was not expecting to hear string arrangements, uh, orchestra in, in tow with Nick Drake, and not just the actual sound of the orchestra, which obviously, <laughs> it's great, like, God. But, I'm gonna say it again. Listen to how it's used here. In a lot of places when an orchestra is brought in, especially with just like, for lack of a better word, I know there's a band with them, but like a one-man band, especially something that's typically as Con as contained, I guess you could say, and isolated as like a lot of acoustic and folk music. When an orchestra comes in, it can overpower, it can override, it can take away instead of giving in stride. <laughs> but here, there's one moment when the strings kind of cut, cut just a little bit and start kind of playing. But for the most part, it's just this very even bed of mellow, near ominous, atmosphere that just drifts like a light fog on the ground and once again nick drake is front and center but it's just that slight orchestra sound that like like i said i'm feeling a little bit of like this ominous a little suspense but there's also a piece with it he really does a great job of balancing the light and the dark the moody with the uplifting and he's just kind of striding that line and sometimes tiptoeing back and forth and i think that's where a lot of the mystery is left because Obviously, I'm going to go into the lyrics and we'll look at it and stuff like that. But just off the surface, first listen that I gave it right now, there, there's, there's a mix of emotions, kind of like what I said before with his voice. He captures a lot of different moments. He captures shadow, but also captures light with what he's saying and what he's, what he's doing here. That orchestra, the string arrangement in here was a surprise to me, but a very, very welcome surprise. Uh, on this particular track, I almost stopped the recording for this video. On this particular track, uh, you're going to have Harry Robinson, who's going to be taking care of the string arrangement. Just to dive into his Wikipedia page here, says that he worked as a musical director on British television shows in the 50s and the 60s. Uh, let's look at some of what he's, he's uh, written and stuff here. He says he's 
written and arranged for, I don't know, like any of these shows that I'm looking at, but maybe you guys might be familiar with some of them. The File, File of the Golden Goose, The Vampire Lover, Lovers, Countess Dracula, Lust for a Vampire, Fright, Demons of the Mind, Twins of Evil. Okay. The Ghoul, uh, Legend of the Werewolf. So I'm seeing a lot of like horror kind of, kind of work in like in his career. This is interesting then. Let's take what we just heard from those orchestral arrangements and apply it to what we just learned about a lot of his career. Because I'm looking at like three quarters of what he's done here looks like just by name, like it's related to horror. The strings that he used here are not bright, happy, bouncing, gleeful, or anything of the sort. They are low, moody, tension inducing, just like I said, that light fog. So how perfect is that because yeah you can definitely hear his experience with horror movies with building t tension and suspense and the way that it's captured there in the me come on now come on <laughs> oh man let's get into these lyrics betty came by on her way says she had a word to say about things today and fallen leaves so like i'm telling you Already just in the first lines, without knowing how this ends or where this goes, there's something, to me, a little nerve-wracking about this and a little ominous in the way that this is presented. Betty comes over today to talk about the falling leaves and about the things of today. Said she hadn't heard the news, hadn't had the time to choose a way to lose, but she believes. Gonna see the river man, gonna tell him all I can about the plan for lilac time if he tells me all he knows about the way his river flows and all night shows in summertime. So there's almost, to me, listen, I, I don't know. This is just where my mind goes. There's almost this folk mythology that's being built here. Who is the river man? That's my question. Is, is the river man, um, d river sticks? Um, what's his name? Sharon. I, I always, <laughs> if I forget the name, <laughs> I always have to think of, of Ozzy Osbourne, Sharon, Sharon. Um, this is cool though. Betty said she prayed today. Once again, there's a little bit of like an ominous, an ominousity in there. And at that particular moment, the strings evoke that suspense. They evoke a little bit of like, ooh, like there's a, almost a twist there. That's a great, great way of capturing that emotion. Betty said she prayed today for the sky to blow away or maybe stay. She wasn't sure. So one way or another, she's looking for answers. She doesn't know what answer she wants, but she knows she's looking for answers. For when she thought of summer rain calling for her mind again, she lost the pain and stayed for more. Gonna see the river man, gonna tell him all I can about the ban of feeling free. If he tells me all he knows about the way his river flows, I don't suppose it's meant for me. Oh, how they come and go. Let's let's look at this one, because I'm not sure, there's a little bit of a, a blurriness, I would say. There's a, there's a, a, a what's the word? There's a lyrical blurriness in this track that I think is really nice. And maybe this is just me not knowing anything, but it kind of lends itself, like I said, to this kind of ominous folk song. But at the same time, it, there's a lot of left up into interpretation in here. I'm sure there's a direct meaning, but let's, let's see if we can, let's see if we can figure this out. Drake did not reveal the identity of the Betty character Although Trevor Dan speculated that she may have been drawn from Betty Foy, a character in Woodsworth's The Idiot Boy, a poem Drake had studied while attending college, or Cambridge. However, the only similarity in the poem is the existence of Betty. Now, I have not heard of that poem, The Idiot Boy, so I can't say anything according to that. Um, uh, but I'm, I'm curious as to what this song means, because you can, you can dive into this one and really kind of get a lot. Um, gonna see the river man, gonna go to someone for answers, says that she's prayed. And maybe when she's prayed, she didn't get the answers because she didn't even know what she wanted. So instead of praying to God, maybe she has to go to this river man, could be a shaman, could be going to the river in general. I don't, I, I don't know. There, there's something here, river, life, you know, the flowing of life, feeling free. They said there's a ban on feeling free. I just feel like she's looking for answers, but she doesn't know where to go. I don't know. <laughs> this is this is really one of those that you can you can dive into and, and get a thought, or it's, it could be like what I said before with Sharon, the river sticks. Maybe she has no answers in life, so she's looking onto the other side, crossing that river. Maybe literally, physically. May, well, not, maybe not literally, but you know what I mean, mythologically uh, or figuratively, spiritually. I don't know. Run with me, river man. You haven't listened to David Sylvian. What are you? doing don't don't 
don't even watch this video, just go. All right. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and move on to the next track here, uh, which is going to be three hours, which if I keep on mentioning David Sylvian, this reaction video might go on a little bit. <laughs> time are you are you enjoying yourself because i'm having a fantastic time over here i'm having a wonderful time three hours all right Let, let's let's just put this out there nick drake and danny thompson in their own way are shredding they are just going off towards each other i love nick drake's guitar playing i think that in this album the what we've heard of it so far his guitar playing is 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 very impressive to me you know, I know I've mentioned this before listening to Pink Moon, but, and I've asked because I'm not a guitar player, so I have no frame of reference, but his playing sounds quietly intense. You know, there is that intensity there. It's like with his singing, there's a deep emotion there. Maybe it's not the flashiest of playing and performing, but there is, there is a, a very deep performance that's happening in front of us. Uh, or in front of our ears. And then Danny Thompson, he's kind of lit and loose on this track a little bit. Like, you know, he's still keeping the vibe, but he's he's pushing it a little bit, right? Uh, but it sounds so, so good. And then you have, once again, an unexpected element in this track. Um, I almost said yesterday, but on the previous track, it was, of course, that strings, the string arrangement. And then here, you're going to have the percussion, uh, specifically congas, which are going to be performed by Rocky. I'm going to mispronounce this. Z Zidzorno, Zidzornu, uh, I apologize if I, apologize if I mess, mess that up, but uh, his name, nickname, Rocky Dijon, was a Ghanaian percussionist known for playing with Rolling Stones, of course, Nick Drake, Ginger Baker, Stevie Wonder, Billy Preston, and Joe Walsh, woo! He's played with a lot of people, he's played, Herbie Hancock too, I see him there, mmm, that is awesome, so yeah, he's obviously very experienced, and I like once again that he brought a certain rhythm, a certain life into this track, but didn't take away from the meaning. You know, he, he brought a vitality into this. He brought a movement, but he didn't take away from any of the emotions behind that movement. He added just the right amounts. Perfect salt, perfect pepper. Three hours from sundown, Jeremy flies, hoping to keep the sun from his eyes. Ease from the city and down to the cave in search of a master, in search of a slave. So we're having another story set up. And what I was gonna say before, <laughs> when the when the track first started before the congas came in i was going to say that the guitar was really starting to set up a story like you could imagine that this establishing shot happening uh in in the music and visually in a sense at that point three hours from london giacomo's free taking his woes down to the sea in search of a lifetime to tell when he's home in search of a story that he's never or that's never been known Three hours from speaking, everyone's flown, not wanting to be seen on their own. Three hours is needed to leave from them all, three hours to wonder and three hours to fall. So we have a little bit of a, uh, almost like a nursery rhyme in here, you know, with this whole three hours and he's applying it to many different people, many different situations. And it's always three hours before some event happens. Now, why? is it three hours before these events? What is the purpose? When I think about, you know, if I have to be somewhere in three hours, it's 1.17 right now. If I have to be somewhere about 4.30, I'm thinking that I'm not really preparing to go and, and, you know, do whatever it is, but maybe I'm mentally preparing. Maybe I'm making preparations. I'm planning the next few hours and the next pieces of time in accordance to that appointment later on. So maybe there's a relation in that because I'm just trying to apply like, what's the three hours? And then he repeats the verse there again. So that's at least like what I kind of think of. <laughs> um, with the Giacomo's free line, it says, in this case, Nick might refer to Italian romantic poet and philologist, 
Giacomo Leopardi, whose writings often dealt with reflections on human existence and the search of its meaning with frequent looks at aging and mortality. Can I say something really quick? This is another tangent. You know what I miss? I don't know if I miss, but it's something I think about occasionally. I love philosophers and like deep thoughts and, and deep discussions of stuff like that. Can you imagine how, listen, listen, can you imagine how different Twitter would be if it was, if it existed like in the 1600s, 1800s and such? And like, obviously you're still going to have some mess on there, but can you imagine like the, the sharing of deep thoughts and philosophies and different worldviews at that time? Like, with like this kind of like brand of intelligence, I don't know. I'm just thinking back. I'm just thinking of like, I know I'm going earlier, but like, what if Socrates had Twitter? Like he'd be... His tweets would be kind of fire. Some examples of Liparty's constant analysis of life include poems like To Sylvia, Night Song of the Wandering Shepherd in Asia, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And what could arguably represent his most famous writing ever, The Infinite, the final words are of which are probably reflected in Nick Drake's lyric, and into this immensity my thought sinks ever drowning, and it is sweet to shipwreck in such a sea. Like he says, his thoughts are drowning in a sense, like there is a, a, a danger, I guess you could say there's an ending, but it's a joy to have these thoughts in the first place and to go to such depths. I don't know. Uh, I'm still swimming in shallow waters over here. I'm still in the kiddie pool trying to apply myself into the lyrics in here and hearing what I think. But like I said, I'm, I'm thinking I'm blowing bubbles, so to speak. Uh, let's move on into the next track here. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm going to take the next two uh, and finish out the first side of the album since they're a little bit shorter. Uh, so that's going to be way to blue, not way too blue, like, hey, that color is a little bit too blue, but way too blue, like as in going to blue. And then day is done. So I guess that three hours till sundown just ran up. Let's go ahead and let these play. Oh, almost pressed the wrong button. going to be him without any other instruments just the orchestra how harsh is that way that the strings come up like breaking on the waves hitting the shore I don't care. I don't care. I'm declaring side one of this album a masterpiece. That's what we're doing today. I'm declaring side one a masterpiece. Nick Drake, Five Leaves Left. I didn't like purposely choose these two, so two songs because they went together or anything. I just did them because they were short and I was like, let's put them together. Um, but how perfectly do they go together? I'm taking off my headphones to make this statement. <laughs> okay. Where do we begin? Where do we begin? Way Too Blue is nothing but the strings alongside of Nick Drake singing. And I, I love how at this moment we've removed all the other instruments. We've taken away. And how, how like enchanting is it just listening to him singing with that orchestra? It's wonderful. It's unexpected. At least to me. Once again, first time listening through the album, but I'm sure like for you guys as well, whether this is your first time or when you heard it for your first time, just the progression in the album, the adding in of instruments, the taking away of instruments, the way it's all done is like, it keeps it very engaging to listen to. There, There's so many different moods just musically in here that I just think it's absolutely fantastic. And then when it transitions into Day Is Done, it keeps the orchestra. Let's let's save one element from the previous track and let's reintroduce Nick's guitar playing. And his guitar playing, I'm just saying once again, is just out of this world. His picking is fast. These are not slim pickings. These are fat pickings, just doo -doo -doo. <coughs> not like that. <laughs> you know what I mean? But his playing is immaculate in here. Like I said, I mean, I still cannot tell you, you know, where he is on, you know, best guitar players ever or anything like that. But he sounds more than adequate, more than technical, uh, so much prowess with what he's doing here. I, I'm in love with it. The, the music between the two tracks changes from something slightly 
like, I don't know. This is just, let me just express myself in my own poetic way. <laughs> like the way he's singing in, I don't know what he's singing about yet, but the way he's singing from the two tracks, it moves from something not eerie, but if I can use the word again, moody and atmospheric into something slightly brighter, filled with hope, filled with maybe this is going to work out, filled with sunshine in the future. I don't know, there's a there's a change in emotions between the two tracks. Like I said, we'll have to look into actually what the strings, not the strings, but the lyrics are and everything, because I could be completely off, but uh, just, to, just to throw that out there. Also, I just want to say one thing. I'm, I'm going to mention it one more time. I'm going to say it one more time. I would like to say that Way Too Blue <laughs> reminded me of uh, Waterfront by David Sylvian off of the Secrets of the Beehive. Hold on, my wife is texting me really quick. <laughs> Uh, she said, I hop coffee or McCafe, Dunkin' A's Express is expensive. Listen, only on, on the weekends, on Saturday and Sundays, we make a pot of coffee. So like, and we make like a nice pot of coffee. This is another tangent. You're with me. You're here. Um, and I said like, we should get like a nice coffee that we can like, you know, save for the weekends. Um, so let me just tell her, I hop co coffee or McCafe, Dunkin' is too expensive. I'm going to say McCafe. I think McDonald's coffee is, is pretty, pretty fire if you will anyways well what else was i going to say about this track listen you know what's more important than doing a reaction video listen you answer your wife you answer your partner every single time so on the string arrangement on this particular track is going to be robert kirby uh actually here uh let me see if there's a wikipedia article for him just so we can see if there's you know past experience what has he done uh that maybe contributes here because the strings here are much more for lack of a better word rich you know uh let me see here. And by the way, as I'm pulling up his Wikipedia article, I don't know what constitutes this type of sound that I'm about to mention, but would you guys consider this like Baroque folk? Because when I think of Baroque, and I, I really do not know the meaning, so I'm just literally making this up. When I think of Baroque, I think of like kind of chamber music. Like it's, it's not a full orchestra. It's like a smaller, it's kind of, rich and dense but it moves at a slower pace not so romantic i don't know would you guys just uh, anyway anyways he's best known for his work here and another album uh but he is also known for working with vashti bunyan elton john straubs paul weller elvis costello yeah he's got he's got the pedigree <laughs> he's got the career and pulling up uh the discography that he's worked with oh there's names on here there's there's names who else could I could I mention that I recognize? Um, I mean, you guys probably recognize more than me. Uh, audience, House on the Hill. We listen to a little audience. John Cale, okay. Obviously, Straubs, like I mentioned before, and many, 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 many others on here. So, I'm very experienced in uh, in what he brings here to the the album at this particular point. Uh, let's dive into some of these lyrics, though, huh? While I got your attention, way too blue. Let's back on up to that really quick. Don't you have a word to show what may be done? Have you ever heard a way to find the sun? Tell me all that you may know. Show me what you have to show. Won't you come and say if you know the way to blue? So he's, he's basically saying, just give it to me straight. Whatever answer you have, whatever you got, just give it to me. Be directly or be direct and don't beat around this bush. Have you ever or have you seen the land living by the breeze? Can you understand a light among the trees? Look through time and find your rhyme. Tell us what you find. We will wait at your gate, hoping like the blind. All right. If I remember correctly, going back to my drama class where I learned about Oedipus Rex, um, uh, what was his, what was his daughter's name? Or Antigone and all those people. All right. Didn't, Tiresias, right? He was the blind prophet. Yeah. Tiresias, I'm pretty sure he was always at the city gate, if I remember correctly. Right? That, that's where he hung out. Um... I think this track is really, once again, kind of talking about looking for answers. You know, you have the whole blind prophet kind of thing. Uh, he's just looking for answers whether, wherever he finds them. And he's saying that we will wait at your gate, hoping like the blind. Maybe. Maybe I'm diving into another direction. I think I'm diving too far in. <laughs> I need to come back. I need to come back to shore. I think I'm, 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 I'm wrong. Uh, can you now recall all that you have known? Will you never fall when the light has flown? Will you never fall when the light has flown? Will this knowledge 
make you stand taller or will your ending be the same as everyone else's? Tell me what all that you may know. Show me what you have to show. Why don't you come and say if you know the way to blue? If you have this knowledge, share it. If you learn something, if you experience something that you think can benefit others around you, share it. Don't hold it to yourself and show us the way to blue. That's at least what I'm kind of reading into it. That, that's, that's what I see. I, I could be wrong. I could be diving again, but that's at least what I see. And then moving on to the next track, Day is Done. When the day is done, down to earth. See this? <laughs> Gone to earth. Okay, it was the David Sylvian album, but it's close enough. Uh, <clears throat> Let me start over. When the day is done, down to earth then sinks the sun, along with everything that, has, that was lost and won when the day is done. So obviously we're talking about the end, and of course the day ends, the sun sets, and... Everything is done at that point, no matter what. You know, whether you lost or won, the day is done. When the day is done, hope so much your race will be all run. Then you find you jumped the gun. Have to go back where you began when the day is done. So sometimes uh, a new day is, of course, a new opportunity to make changes, to correct the things that maybe you, you missed out on, you messed up on the day before. You now have another chance, a second chance, and a lot of chances, by the way. Uh, to fix that, to, to try again. Every day is a new opportunity. When the night is cold, some get by, but some get old. Just to show life's not made of gold when the night is cold. When the bird has flown, got no one to call your own. Got no place to call your home when the bird has flown. So looking through the lyrics here, that's at least what I'm getting out of it. The day sets on everybody. The day's going to set here. The sun's going to set over where you are. And that will end this collective time that we've been given in the span of these 24 hours or these this day but once again there's a new day there's a new chance for something else for us to improve upon ourselves and the sun is going to set on my day differently than the sun is going to set on your day it may end negatively with me and i really need that second chance it may end beautifully for you have the best day of your life and then, of course, it's going to restart. It's going to start again and, and stuff. So I think that's kind of the, um, not the dichotomy, but the, there's a word I want to use. That's the, for lack of a better word, the motion and that rotation that, you guys see it on for me, like the circle that, um, uh, that's the, <laughs> what is that word, guys? Uh, when, like that continuous cycle, it's a cycle. Let's use that. It's the cycle. Just like the day-night cycle, it's also a cycle for us to start over again and end our day. Anyways! <laughs> that, that's, that's what I'm gonna, that's what I'm gonna stop on that one. Uh, let's go ahead and move on to the next side here. We're gonna move on to side two of the album, uh, which is going to start off with two tracks that I had mentioned already. I have already heard. You can find those reactions somewhere in the backlog on the channel cello song and the thoughts of mary jane however you all know that halfway into an album listen i like to ask you a question to see who's really around to see who's stuck around to see who's still here not i was not still breathing but still here i want you breathing obviously but i want because the analytics always say people leave like at different times i'm just curious to see who's here so so what can i do let, let what i'm gonna i'm gonna ask you a question and in the comments uh, below, in the comments down below, I just want you to type in what, what, hold on, hold on, you gotta give me a second here, I want you to type in uh, what you see, hold on, hold on. See, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna break the fourth wall a little bit, just type in the comments, like on your first word, what you see on the screen, what do you see? What do you see there? I got cute, you so cute, alright, just type that in. Anyways, let's go ahead and move on to the next track over here. And uh, that'd be Cello Song. I'm going to let these two play, and we'll talk about both of them after, since I've already heard them before. We're not going to spend a ton of time on them. Comes out rambling with that guitar. And that's way that game? she's been and who she's seen
So we're not going to spend a ton of time talking about these two tracks because like I said, I've already done a video on these two, but just to kind of like briefly go back into it for, for a second listen, a song review, if you will, I like the contrast between the tracks because Thoughts of Mary Jane, kind of like its subject matter, is very light, is very, very gentle, very passive and peaceful and very just like relaxed, you know, I mean, it's really thoughtful and introspective, but of course, with a different approach. The flutes, I said in the beginning, but I, listen, the beginning moment, if you just take those first like 10 seconds, it sounds like an early Genesis song. I'm just throwing that out there. It, it does, right? But of course, the way that he sways in his delivery, who can know? I love the way that he sings that line so quick, who can know? And then he goes into it, of course, uh, like I said, the flutes, which e eventually is accompanied by some more strings coming in and lifting everything even more powerful the ending uh just for like a little bit just for like a few seconds it speeds up really quickly i'm sure it speeds up maybe setting us up for maybe the next track there and the momentum there is carried over but i just love how sweet sounding this one is it's very delightful and very gentle uh to touch and then moving back to cello song there you go uh it starts off the second side of the album kind of moving quickly into it. I like that motif, of course, in the cello. The singing is great. Um, let me pull up here really quick. That's gonna be Claire Lothar on the cello who's playing that. We have the return of Rocky on the congas, once again, and adding to that momentum and to that rhythm there. And it's just the way that everything builds up it is so beautiful. Of course, the tones, I would say, are different between the two tracks. One, perhaps a little more earthy. The other, I would say, a little bit more airy. If that makes sense. Um, but once again, it's that contrast between these two tracks that I think makes it such an interesting listen. Uh, lyrically, once again, I'm not gonna not gonna dive as deep as we've been on the past few tracks, but for cello song, strange face with your eyes so pale and sincere, underneath you know well you have nothing to fear. For the dreams that came to you when so young, told of a life when spring is sprung, looking forward to something on the horizon, looking forward to the future. But wood seems so frail in the cold of the night when the armies of emotion go out to fight. But while the earth sinks to its grave, you sail to the sky on the crest of a wave. Uh, so, of course, like I said, this is a very hopeful track in some ways. Uh, it says here uh, that this track is one of three, uh, including three hours and time of no reply, that were broadcast on John Peel's radio show for the BBC in 1969. And then two months later, he opened for Fairport Convention. That's actually really cool. It says, uh, this is from Michael Chapman remembering the performance. The folkies did not take to him. They wanted songs with choruses. They completely missed the point. They didn't say a word the entire evening. It was actually quite painful to watch. I don't know what the audience expected. I mean, they must have known they weren't going to get see chances and sing-alongs at a Nick Drake gig. You know, if you don't know what you're getting into, I guess I can understand disappointment to an extent. You know, when you get something that you don't, you know, you don't understand or maybe, you know, they didn't get it, but can you imagine how, how awesome it would have been to see Nick Drake there and, you know, in one of his, his performances? I don't know. I, they did, that's one of those moments that they probably didn't realize what they were getting until later on. And then, of course, getting into thoughts of Mary Jane. Who can know the thoughts of Mary Jane? Why she flies or goes out in the rain? Where she's been? Who she's seen in her journey to the stars? We're really just personifying the smoke rising. And like I said, this... This particular track is very gentle in its rise. Who could know what happens in her mind? Did she come from a strange world and leave her mind behind? Her long lost sighs and her brightly colored eyes tell her story to the wind as the wind is where that smoke shall be blown to. Obviously, beautiful tracks. Let's move on into the next one here, which is going to be not man in a box, but man in a shed. What's he doing in there? Is he working on something? sets up the guitar in a certain way. Wow. Oh, so Nick filled in the right and then piano and bass well, filling in the left. Whenever he saw her, he could have listened Did she friend zone him? So Man in the Shed is a really cool track from a production standpoint. Obviously, it's cool from a music standpoint. But <laughs> because when it began, you just have solemn, lonely guitar in isolation that strictly is heard, at least for myself, on the right earphone, on the right side. And I'm like, I heard some static on the side. I was like, I hope there's nothing that's messed up over here. And then out of nowhere, 
uh, you have the bass and the piano, which suddenly spark up and fill in the space on the left. And then just a second or so later, Nick Drake vocally fills up the center. So just the way that it was produced and how everything entered the room, kind of from different sides of the stage, I thought that was a really nice trick and that was a really nice introduction into the music. Uh, the, the use of the piano, once again, another unexpected instrument that makes its appearance because I don't believe we've had, have we had piano before in the album? We did, it was on the first track. Oh, maybe I wasn't listening. But <laughs> you, have, you have piano at least a lot more evidence and not so subtle in this track. And listen to how the piano and actually Thompson play. One is very jazzy in their approach, very jazzy. This might be the, the, to me, the most jazzy track on the album at this point. But the piano also adds this certain light. It's very lilting in its approach. It's very blossoming. Da -da 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 -da. Like it's just very bright and happy and it adds this kind of step. You know, I don't like the phrase, but it adds a certain pep in the step, right? On the piano here is going to be Paul Harris. Let's take a look at his Wikipedia page here. Uh, he is an American. Uh, keyboard player, appears on several albums from leading artists such as Stephen Stills, B.B. King, Judy Collins, Grace Slick, Al Cooper, ABBA, Nick Drake, of course, John Martin, John Sebastian, John Mellencamp, Joe Walsh, Bob Seger, and the list goes on in there. So, obviously, once again, a very, very well-regarded, uh, uh, well, well, talented <laughs> musician, I couldn't think of the word, uh, and I love how he contributes his skills to this particular track. It just, once again, adding this certain light. You know when when a light, what is it, like a Jacob's Ladder, a light comes through the clouds and it just, it's this beautiful actual, like, ray of light. That's what his piano added into the music here. I think that was a wonderful touch. And I think that he and specifically Danny got down and got together really nicely in their slightly jazz adjacent approach in this track. Kind of makes me a nice jazz with the folk, you know? Jazz folk. Well, there was a man who lived in a shed, spent most of his days out of his head, for his shed was rotten, lit in the rain, said it was enough to drive any man insane. When it rained, he felt so bad. When it snowed, he felt just simply sad. Of course, this shed could be physical, but it could also just be representative of his mind and his state in a particular way. Well, there was a girl who lived nearby. Whenever he saw her, he could only sigh, but he, she lived in a house so very big and grand. For him, it seemed like some distant land. So that's another way of saying she was out of his league. Uh, when he called her sh his shed to mend, she said, I'm sorry, you'll just have to find a friend. Friend zone he was that day. Well, this story is not very new, but the man is me. Yes, the girl is you. Breaking a little bit of a fourth wall, a little autobiographical. So leave your house, come to my shed. Please stop my world from raining through my head. Please don't think I'm not your sort. You'll find that sheds are nicer than you thought. Now, the metaphor is clearly spelled out here in the track, but I think once again that he does a great job of, of balancing the more poetic words here and this kind of plot and storyline, but then kind of throwing that all away and saying, listen, this is about me and you. <laughs> listen, please, you know, you are you are so, for lack of a better word, out of my league, but listen, I, you're, I, I will promise you will find nothing more than a gentleman and a great relationship. Just give us a try. Come here and visit my shed and perhaps help mend my, my heartbreak and, and my lack of love, you know? I don't know, that's, that's really nice, I like that. Uh, let's move on to the next track, Fruit Tree. What kind of fruit? I don't know, let's dive on in, grab us a bite, and we'll go from there. Besides the guitar, different way. Well, now it's back, but some man of fame, fruit tree, fruit tree. Okay, this is one of those tracks that, of course, when it debuted, it had meaning, but now, and of course, especially after Nick Drake's death, has a whole another meaning it's almost prophetic it's almost foreboding of his career and it captures a certain drama in in the way that the orchestra escalates everything i see that you have some uh, other instruments here you have oboe 
English horn as well. The horns are pushing a certain narrative. This is a very sad song. Like I said, you can't help but listen to this song now and apply it to Nick Drake himself. When, yes, he may have been applying it to himself before, but in a different way. Uh, lyrically, he's basically saying that people never get the roses while they can still smell them. People, artists specifically, you know, of course, I'm talking exceptions. You know, certain artists aren't recognized or, or they're, you know, they're not made popular or known, more known, until they die. And then all of a sudden everyone comes out the woodworks and, you know, that's not a necessarily a negative thing. It's just sometimes the way things happen. You know, that, that's just the way uh, the cookie crumbles, so to speak, sometimes. But, of course, like, this is now kind of applied to Nick Drake because, and please correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm, I'm speaking off of comments that I've read, you know, past and stuff like that. But Nick Drake and his music wasn't really appreciated so much at the time of its release. We just read a little bit about, you know, the concert and, you know, the expectations of the crowd. But it wasn't really until after his death that his music began to catch that cult classic into critical acclaim and into that discovery. But how sad that he never got to reap the fruits that he has sowed. And taking this track outside of the lyrical sense, which like I said, the lyrics are obviously great in what we just said, take just the music because the music itself evokes and presents that same kind of feeling, this feeling of longing, this feeling of I'm putting my best effort in, I'm, I'm putting it down, but is anyone really going to see this? Is anyone really going to pay attention or appreciate it? You know, an artist puts out their work because they hope that someone relates to it. They hope that someone understands it and, and can feel the same perhaps feelings and, and vicariously have that connection. You know, a, an artist, if they only cared about what they did and didn't care about putting it out, they would just never put it out. But there is that connection that you want to have and you want to establish with fans, of course. And to an extent, it, it seems like, like Nick Drake never really got to see the true fruition of that. And once again, like the music here, the way the, the, the oboe and the horns and the strings, everything erupts with this dense, kind of tension-filled abstractness. The way they clear and release, leaving only isolation once again in the guitar. The way the strings come back and simmer a little bit. There's this push and pull that's going on in the music that I feel like is a push and pull that an artist feels with their work and trying to find their audience. There's a lot you can dive into with this one. Uh, let's go ahead and do so. Fame is but a fruit tree, so very unsound. It can never flourish till its stock is in the ground. And this being his debut album, this truly is him planting the seed for his career and for his artistry. So men of fame can never find a way till time has flown far from their dying day. Forgotten while you're here, remembered for a while, a much updated ruin from a much outdated style. And here's the line. Life is but a... Well, actually, this isn't the line. Hold on. Uh, <laughs> Life is but a memory happened long ago. Theater full of sadness from a long forgotten show. Seems so easy just to let it go on by till you stop and wondered why you never wondered why. And then he has this kind of retreat in the next line where he says, safe in the womb of an everlasting night, you'll find the darkness can give the brightest light. Of course, that light being your art that's left over for the world to view, uh, but the darkness, your death. Safe in your place deep in the earth, that's when they'll know what you're really worth. Only after you're gone and buried, that's when your worth is really accounted for. Uh, and then the ending is where I think that he really just kind of goes autobiographical in a sense. And like I said, this is, of course, foreboding uh, the future in, in a way. But fruit tree, fruit tree, no one knows you but the rain and the air. Don't you worry, they'll stand and stare when you're gone. Fruit tree, fruit tree, open your eyes to another year. They'll all know that you were here when you're gone. That last line there could truly end the album, could be an epitaph on a, a marker on someone's gravestone. They'll all know that you were here when you're gone. Is that the hardest line in the album? I don't know. I think that's an extremely powerful song, only made more powerful, obviously, by real life circumstances. Let's go ahead and march forward. Let's move on into the final track of the album. I hope that you guys have been having a great time here. I hope that you've enjoyed listening to the music alongside with me. Let's finish it up with Saturday Sun, which is kind of funny because it's Saturday right now. Let's go.
I like that part when he sings could have been like the high note in anyone else's discography or song. So Sunday, he still Sunday. keeps it constrained. Take this track, the ending of the album, and the mood that it leaves us with. Think about the journey that we've went on, the album, the tracks, going one by one by one. And the feeling that we've been left with with Saturday Sun is this little bit of weekend optimism. Like, yeah, we've gone through a lot. There, There is a lot going on. But look at the bright side. Look at what we get to experience. Look at what we get to have. That's what I feel like is the, the mood here on Saturday Sun. Kind of completely different, but not so different. You know, it feels like a nice progression, which this album has a great progression, not only musically, but definitely emotionally and tonally. Uh, of course, let's talk about the mood of this one, because this almost takes on a little bit of like a, I would, I would argue, half blues, like a slow blues, and then a half gospel -y kind of approach, and especially the notes and the melodies, like the piano, I would definitely say. Uh, Danny Thompson's going to bring that jazziness into there as well. Uh, now, what's interesting here is that Drake is actually switching out, basically, his guitar for a piano in this track. It's Drake playing the piano. And I think he plays really nicely in here. And then you're also going to have the vibraphone. I knew it was something. I always get them confused. Marimba, vibraphone, xylophone, the other thing. There's another thing. I can't remember what it is now. Um, and on that, you're going to have Tristan Fry, who's also playing the drums, which, like I said as well, this is the first track that has like just traditional drum set here. Uh, so Tristan Fry... Uh, let's see. Let's see some of his credentials. Who he's played with? He's played with. Uh, he's worked with the Beatles, Frank Sinatra, John Martin, Elton John, David Essex. Wow, he's worked with. He, he got some great session musicians here on this album. Let's just put that out there. You got some great session musicians because, like I said, Nali is he playing the drums? Just a simple, you know, little jazz brushwork just to push everything along nicely, give it that crispiness, but he's also handling that vibraphone, which truly just adds, you know, this, this playful lightness into the music. When you hear vibraphone for the most part, you know, you hear like that, da -da -da -da, like it just kind of brightens up the day a little bit. And with Nick Drake's piano playing, I would say doubly so. Great combination. And like I mentioned during the song in the last three quarters of it, when it's in that last, I don't know what you would say, but like that last hurrah, when any other artist, well, not any other, but like certain artists would really push out their notes. They would really go for it. And there's nothing wrong with that. It has a place, of course. Um, when, you, when you'd really hit that high note for that last hurrah in the song before you end the whole album, he still doesn't do that. He still keeps his control. He, he still never wavers in his emotion and what he's trying to, to deliver here. He doesn't have the most vocal range. Why is that needed for this? You've listened to the album alongside me. Not once was it needed. Not once to me. Is there like, oh, I wish he did this or that, you know, with more vocal range. No. He uses what he has and he uses it to great effect to deliver the emotion that he's trying to, to show us and express. And I think that he expressed that emotion perfectly here. Saturday sun came early one morning in a sky so clear and blue. Saturday sun came without warning so no one knew what to do. Saturday sun brought people and faces that didn't seem much in their day. But when I remember those people in places, they were too, really too good in their way. Saturday sun won't come and see me today in their way. So there's this sun he sees that shines on other people, but it's not shining on him today. But he's not giving up. Think about stories with reason and rhyme circling through your brain, and think about people in their season and time returning again and again, again and again. But Saturday sun has turned to Sunday's rain so Sunday sat in the Saturday sun and wept for a day gone by. So like I said, in this track, you have that emotion of, you know, everyone's, everyone's in this positive place. You know, you see people smiling and happiness, but why not me? Why isn't the Saturday sun shining on me the same way? You could interpret, of course, Saturday come and goes, and now I'm left with Sunday rain. Like I never got the chance, uh, you know, to, to enjoy that Saturday sun. However, just because of the mood of this particular track, which, like I said, to me sounds much more positive, I'm going to say that he's not ending on a sad note. He's actually ending on a more hopeful note because I think that this kind of harkens back and references to the, the previous track, 
or was talking about every day is a new day. Every day is a new opportunity. So this may not have been his day, but that doesn't mean that there won't be a day. And with that note, we are ending and wrapping up this album reaction from Nick Drake, Five Leaves Left. Okay, genuinely, a, a, a really, really enjoyable album. Like, I really love the first side. The second side is, is strong too. Don't, eat, don't get it twisted. But the first side, it just hits completely different. Um, favorite song for me personally on the album? I'm gonna, listen, can I just, can I just put like, Way Too Blue and Day Is Done. I would like to just line those up together. Let's just put them on even keel. I'm gonna line those up together. Maybe River Man after that. Um, thoughts of Mary Jane? Ah. That's where I'm going. I'm gonna say at the moment, Day Is Done, or I'm sorry, uh, let's put Way Too Blue, Day Is Done, River Man, Thoughts of Mary Jane. I think that's my ranking for right now, for right now. But this was such a superb album. Um, I don't even know what to say, it's, except thank you guys so much once again for being here, for listening to the album with me. Once again, thank you so much for actually sending the album here. And, and I hope that you enjoyed it, listening to it with me as well. Uh, don't forget, if it's your first time here, if you sat here, if it's your first time watching this channel and you sat here, you got to this point, I cannot thank you enough. You have to comment. You have to comment and say, hey, it's my first time here. I just stumbled here, blah, blah, blah. Introduce yourself. I'd be happy to, to uh, write back to you. Sometimes it takes me a day or two. Just give me some time, but I, I will get back to you. Um, of course, if it's your returning time, thank you as always for being here. Uh, don't forget, please, to check out the artist Suzuka. Uh, like I said, I will link uh, some of her music down below, but please check her out. I think that you guys will enjoy the music. Um, sign up on Patreon if you enjoy what I do and you would like to support me in what I do. Don't have to, but of course it helps me on my end here. Uh, follow me on Twitter. Subscribe. Press that like button. At the end of all this, you better, you better press that like button. <laughs> press the like button as well. And uh, press the share button too. Share it on your Facebook, your Twitter feed, your TikTok, your Instagram, your your Tinder, Grinder. Share it. Just press it. Either way. Appreciate you guys being here. Have a great rest of your day, and I will see you all later, guys. Bye.